Good morning. My name is Roland O'Daniel. I'm the uh, CEO at the Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, and I am proud to offer the opportunity um, for CTL to talk with some teachers who are um, living in this world of, of NTI or non-traditional instruction um, through the COVID virus um, situation. Um, now that schools are out, um, at least temporarily in Kentucky and across the country, teachers are having to deal with a lot of different settings. So we aren't going to try to come out and say, hey, you need to be doing this. But what we wanna do is identify teachers who we think are doing um, innovative approaches or really strong instructional approaches to uh, NTI given their, their situation and highlight them um, to help teachers across the country think about what they're doing differently. I'm incredibly pleased to be joined today by, uh, with uh, Angela Zorn. Um, Angela, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Angela. I am a social studies teacher. I've been teaching for, and this sounds pretty unbelievable to me, this is more than 20 years of teaching now. Uh, over the years, I've taught a little bit of everything in social studies, but right now my position is U.S. history and AP U.S. history. I have all together somewhere around 150 students every day. And so that has definitely influenced the way that I'm dealing with this. Uh, 150 students managed online every day does have some challenges all on its own. And so that has been one of the things I had to take in consideration as I was trying to kind of build this uh, airplane as we were flying it, as we like to say. Yeah, so uh, in our, as we were talking initially, Angela, you, you mentioned that it was pretty much you got Thursday to say, mm -hmm. hey, talk to your kids, find out how many of them have internet, um, tell them what they need to take home because they're not coming back on Friday. Well, we came back on Friday. So Thursday oh, okay. afternoon, we had a faculty meeting and we're told, look, it's looking like this is what's going to happen but we don't know for sure when it's going to happen. We all went home Thursday afternoon and the governor announced um, we will not be coming back to school on Monday. And so our job on that Friday was to talk to our kids uh, and really figure out what we were going to do. We did not put in a delay. You know, some districts made the decision they were gonna delay for a week or more before they jumped into NTI. We didn't do that. We jumped into it immediately. So we spent all day Friday talking to our kids, figuring out who had internet access, and really just trying to get a handle on what we were going to do. Give our kids the best introduction we could. Tell them where to start looking for assignments. Uh, what we expected out of them every day. Uh, but there was not a lot of leave time. We, we went home over the weekend after talking to our kids and tried to get some plans together. We, we reported to school on Monday morning so that we could really make sure that we had worked out most of the glitches. Uh, the governor had not you know, made the announcement that he did not want us in schools as teachers at that point. So we showed up for two days to, to, uh, to make sure that we had all the glitches worked out, any major issues we could deal with as a district. And then starting that Wednesday, we all started working from home. And so it was a very quick turnover and a lot of learning as we went along. So what are some of the expectations that um, your district has in place for you all as teachers um, working in this environment? And so as teachers, we're supposed to be available to our students throughout the day. And so we kind of do a, a a check in ourselves around 8.15 every morning. Uh, our, our administration sends out information for the day. Um, every day we fill out a little form that uh, talks about what we think is working, what help we need, um, and you know, what do we need uh, going forward. Uh, and then from 8.15 until 3.15, we're expected to be kind of available to our students over uh, email or whatever other format that we've set up for our kids. And we're doing that in lots of different ways. And so mostly I'm available over email to my students throughout the day. 
And so I just keep that open and I answer questions all day long. Recording my interactions with kids on a Google document and also recording it into our uh, attendance system so that the district can pull that up and you know, look to see what's going on there. Uh, but I'm also available to my students uh, throughout the day in a kind of a back channel chat room. And so I kind of set up virtual office hours. That was something that, you know, on that Friday when I was thinking very quickly about how I was going to do things, back channels are things that I had worked with with kids before. Um, and so I use a very simple format for that. I just kind of open it up and leave it open to questions for about an hour to an hour and a half every day. So that if they want to have that kind of interaction where we're all in the room at the same time, we can do that. I've also done a couple of Zoom meetings with kids. I did not decide to use those as a way to deliver instruction. Um, so many kids are doing so many different things. As high schoolers, they're working uh, at grocery stores. They're working in uh, fast food restaurants. And because they are now available during the day, they're being called into work. So trying to think about having instruction through a Zoom meeting at a set time every day was going to be difficult for my kids. So the, the times when we do that are times when we're really just kind of getting together to say hello to each other. We've met each other's pets. We're gonna play some trivia games. Um, we might end up watching some, some movies and kind of back channeling through the movies that way. That's more of the, the personal interaction that we're missing in class because that's a huge part of what we do every day. Uh, and so the district really left that open to us in how we were going to interpret that. But we are expected to do check-in with, now for us in high school, uh, we're checking in with our first period every day uh, for attendance purposes. And what I decided to do was to, uh, to use Google Classroom and ask a question every single day. Now I actually do that with every one of my classes because on that Friday when we were making this uh, airplane as we were flying, we didn't really have clear instructions on was it gonna be one period, was it gonna be all of them? So I made the decision that I was gonna check in with, it, with every kid every day. And I ask silly questions every day. Those are not instructional questions. They are not what was traditionally my opening question of the day. Uh, I've asked them their favorite ice cream flavor. I've asked them which of the seven dwarfs do they most identify with? Uh, today was what's their favorite book? But it's a chance for me to, to be able to talk to every kid. And because I'm doing it through questions on Google Classroom, I could reply back. We can have a conversation every single day. Uh, and it's not a conversation about school. And that's kind of a nice little check-in. It's one of my favorite parts of the day is going through and reading their answers to those questions. And so that was a district kind of expectation that you're checking in with at least one class every day so that we have some kind of record of attendance. Uh, and then that we are giving, we unlike some districts decided we were gonna move forward with instruction. And so I'm giving instruction every day. But again, I'm not doing that synchronously. We're not doing that through me lecturing through a meeting every day. I'm giving them, and that's evolved over the time that we've been working, but I'm giving them assignments every day and kind of checking in for feedback. And we are actually grading those assignments. And so they are getting, uh, they are getting grades. We're still figuring out what all that's gonna look like as this extends beyond our original two weeks and then until April 20th and then until May 1st. And we'll see where we are after that. So you're in a unique, a little bit of a unique in that you're also teaching an AP class. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> regardless of whether or not uh, the students need new learning, the AP exam um, is going to be, an, a, it has an impact on how you have to approach mm -hmm. production because your students are going to be taking that national exam, which I understand has been adjusted because of the settings, um, but it still has implications for mm -hmm. how you're reviewing with your students, how you're setting uh, them up for success long term. So um, let's let's talk about the AP exam, um, how it's adjusted and how it has impacted um, what you're doing. Because I, I read one of your posts, and, and, and I didn't mention this, and I should have. For those of you who don't know, Angela is um, 
at Kentucky Teacher, KY Teacher on, on Instagram and uh, Twitter, and is a pretty prolific um, uh, Instagram teacher of, uh, on Instagram and, and in Twitter. So if you want to follow her, I, I highly suggest that you do. So um, anyway, so back to your, now that I've interrupted you. <laughs> You're fine. Back to, back to that. It, so how has the AP exam been adjusted? And then let's talk about your instruction and how you've designed instruction. So. And so, well, the College Board didn't adjust immediately. And so that was something that, you know, we had to kind of jump into not knowing what that was going to look like. And so those first two weeks of instruction were me just moving forward, not knowing what we were going to, to face in the weeks that came. Uh, and so we were, you know, it worked out very nicely with the way the College Board adjusted. We were exactly where the College Board thought we were supposed to be. And so we moved forward and I delivered instruction the best I could uh, on World War II. And that was the spot that we were on. And so I did it through, you know, it was a little more handout centric than I would have liked, but it was still trying to build the skills that I thought were important for my kids. And so every day I posted a handout that had a link to maybe a video Again, not necessarily me delivering the instruction. The great thing about history is there's so many amazing history videos out there. I don't have to be the one delivering the instruction. I can pull up a history video that gives three to four minutes, but it also has imagery from the time period. It has, you know, it gives them all of that kind of stuff. But I also included excerpts from primary source documents because that's such a huge part of the AP exam. And now moving forward, I'm very happy that I did because that's what the AP exam is going to be. What the College Board has chosen to do is to stop the AP exam at 1945, or at least the AP US history exam. And they've made those adjustments in every area. And so it's gonna look different in every subject area where they decided to stop instruction. For me, 1945, which was perfect. We wrapped up World War II uh, during those first two weeks of instruction. And that gave me, again, my timing worked out nicely. It gave me the week over spring break to really think about as they continued to announce their changes, what that was gonna look like for my class. And so by the end of our spring break, which ended uh, on Friday, I knew that they were gonna be taking a shortened DBQ. So they're going to be looking at five documents and doing some writing. Um, and I'm still going through and analyzing kind of the changes to the, to the scoring guide and how that's going to impact us. But my decision at that point was, okay, as much as this hurts my heart, <laughs> these kids are, uh, they've paid for that AP exam and they've done the work. And so we're going to, Kind of stop instruction at 1945. Lots of college classes are centric to time periods anyway. I hate that they're not getting all that time that comes afterwards. Um, but for us, that's where, that's where we're going to stop. And so I thought about, okay, how can I divide up all of that instruction from the College Board has said they're starting in 1754 and going until 1945. I'm gonna take, for us it's nine days because we didn't have school on Monday. So I'm gonna take two weeks, nine days, divide that up. Uh, and I put together a, a Google slideshow that had kind of one section per day, pulled all of our class resources from the, that section, all of the notes and everything that I already had online and linked those because I have no idea what my kids took home with them. You know, typically when we're reviewing, I know what my kids have. I hope they took home because we were all pretty sure where this was headed, but I don't know that they took home their notebooks. I don't know that they have all those materials. So I linked everything we've done in class on those slides. I found tons of videos that went through and talked about key sections. Uh, I already made, and so that made it very easy. I already made a whole set of uh, Quizlet flashcards. I linked all of those. And so every day for the next, you know, nine days, they're looking back over a big chunk of material 
and answering very broad questions that's setting us up to be able to talk about, okay, now let's turn these into essays that are linking time periods. And so after these next two weeks, that's where we're gonna go. We're gonna start working towards that EDQ. We're gonna start working on making those big links between you know, the role of women in this period versus the role of women in that period. Uh, you know, the role of the national government and the economy here versus the role of the government and the national economy there. Uh, and I, for us, I thought that was probably the best way to go. And then I'm trying to build in some, some other kind of unique experiences. Being active on Twitter, um, I decided to take my chances and see what would happen if I started tweeting to some historians and some authors and asked them if they would be willing to do some 20 minute Zoom sessions with my students and they're stuck at home too. And so I found that a huge number of them responded to me very quickly. So some of the people whose books we've read uh, are actually going to do some Zoom sessions with my students and talk to them about those underlying issues. And so we're setting those up, I'm building a schedule for those. Not quite sure exactly what that's gonna look like yet because that's something I was working through last week but it was something to try to give my kids a unique experience uh, considering everything that's going on right now. Yes, I, yeah, I saw you share a couple of those um, uh, tweets the other day and, and uh, I think it's brilliant. I agree, everybody's at home, so how do we all um, interact and, and identify those, those opportunities as they present? I think that's one of the things that, that I think you've done an incredible job of is it's a hard situation, but it's an also an opportunity to think about things a little differently. So let's go back for just a second. When you say you translated your um, current study of World War II into an online environment, again, now constrained by 20 minutes a day mm -hmm. uh, and with a situation where you're not sure what all resources your students have. What I like about what you did is you identified some new content that they could consume or it may have been a review content, but they would consume some content and they had some way of making sense of that content. Gave them that, that worksheet, that graphic organizer. Um, and, and to your own admission, you already filled in the World War I because you weren't positive what they were gonna have available. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the key pieces that we know students need to interact with content and just having them consume information doesn't necessarily get at those skills you mentioned that your students are going to need to be successful in this class. So, so let's go back to those skills. What are those skills? And, and you've already given us a taste of how you're designing um, to support your students and being, uh, being able to show that they have those skills. Um, so I know, and, and for those of, you, those of our audience who may not be social studies teachers, um, DBQs are document-based questions. Um, and so they're gonna get some primary source materials um, that they're gonna to have to do something with. So again, tell me about what those skills are, those processes are, and how you're supporting them. And I don't want you to think that's something that I'm only doing for my AP students, because it looks very, very similar in my regular classes as well. Um, you know, it's all based around US history, but those skills that are important for AP students are also important for students who aren't taking AP classes. Those are just skills that are important for historians. And so being able to go through and analyze and interpret primary source documents is something I build into all of my classes. And so what I was doing in my AP classes looked very, very similar to what I was doing in my non-AP classes. As a matter of fact, in this very shortened time frame, my classes are in different spots in content. So what I was building in my non-AP classes was going to be what my AP classes picked up on as we moved forward past spring break had the College Board not changed the test. And so they would have done the exact same assignments that my non-AP students were doing because once you narrow it down to about 20, 25 minutes worth of instruction, if I'm building those skills in, it's going to look the same for both levels um, just because of the time constraints. And so things that I think are important in my class include things like, again, 
going through and interpreting those primary source documents, pulling from those and figuring out what does that tell us about the history? And beyond that, you know, being able to look at those documents and think about, you know, what biases do the people who created those documents have? Uh, what does that tell us about the time period? Um, you know, what does the author's point of view have to do with how we're interpreting and learning this information? And so those are things that I was trying to build in, again, trying to think about how can I take that into a 20 to 25 minute lesson. And so what I did was I took my big content, the idea that I needed to cover World War II, or I needed to cover uh, the Cold War, and I broke it down into about how many days did I want to spend on it and what were the key topics that fit into those days. And then from there, well, I spent a whole lot of time looking for, again, video clips because I wanted kids to, to have multiple ways to access the material, uh, pulling from uh, open source textbooks because, again, they don't have text in front of them. And posting PowerPoints and things, or it's not going to really help them kind of get the flow of the information. They needed a little bit of a narrative to go with it. And so pulling some of that information, adding those videos, and uh, through Google Classroom, I could link the videos, but also on the handouts I was giving to kids, I was posting QR codes because something that we've done in class, and it helped that this is something that we've actually done in class, is my kids understand that even if their uh, internet access is pretty limited, they can scan the QR code on their phone and they can uh, watch the video clips. And so I embedded those onto the documents that I was giving kids. Uh, and so even the kids who have more limited access to internet can write the answers. And we set up a system within our school and within our district for how those kids were gonna have access to materials. And so, uh, our school buses that are delivering lunches are also delivering and picking up uh, packets of material. And so for, for my kids, those packets look very similar whether they have internet access or not. Uh, because it, it had the QR codes, it had the, the excerpts from primary source documents, and then it was asking them to pull all of those things together through, and again, I couldn't dig very deep. We were, we, uh, we were doing about five, question, about five questions a day to try to make those connections. Uh, now, I played over spring break and created a, a digital notebook using Google Slides. And so that gave me a little more freedom to pull even more information in so I could embed even more. Um, they're listening to interviews with uh, Elizabeth Eckford, who was, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Little Rock Nine, and you've ever seen that photograph of the African-American student walking, actually she's walking away from the school because she's been turned away. And then there's the woman screaming behind her. Elizabeth F. Eckford is the, the girl in the photograph. And so they're listening to an interview with her uh, and they're talking about how that influences their understanding of what happened on that day. Um, so trying to pull in all of those kind of things that uh, you know good historians will do, and usually will take me, you know, days to get through in class and figuring out how to embed all of that into these kind of shortened assignments for students. Well, I appreciate that the example you give there is is that image of the young lady walking away from the school and the person behind them yelling and and the the National Guard. Um, mm -hmm in the image as well. I think one of the things that we uh, need to keep in mind, and especially is that as students are consuming information, they're reading lots of different ways. And in social studies or in history, as you've already pointed out, uh, one of the things we have to do is identify, look for those details. But more importantly, we have to situate those details in context. And I appreciate the fact about thinking about what are the biases that um, accompany people in that era and they're not the same. You may look at an image, something, a similar kind of image that wouldn't have the same um, baggage with it necessarily mm -hmm. if it's from a different, a different era. 
Um, so I, I think that's important. So Tim Shanahan, who's the, the reading um, disciplinary content expert, also does a lot with reading, identified those, those same skills. When historians are reading, um, what are the kinds of things they're doing? And it's exactly what you said. They're looking for those details, but they're really trying to situate that um, within the period and then looking across multiple documents to try to triangulate that, which I, I know you mentioned earlier, this idea of um, women's suffrage in this era compared to women's suffrage mm -hmm. in this era and trying to, to look for consistencies and similarities or differences. So those yeah, one of the things that we've talked about over the years has been that you know, getting kids to read doesn't have to always be getting kids to, to read very traditional written excerpts. And so in a social studies class, it often involves again, getting kids to learn how to read photographs and the information that comes from those photographs and pulling those details. And that's something we do in class all the time by putting up a photograph on the screen and really learning how to systematically, what's the central image? Well, then let's kind of zoom back from that central image. And what do we see behind it? How do those images connect to the history we know? Uh, and so because that's something I've worked with my kids over the course of the year, it's something that we can continue to do in this more, in this very different sort of format. Um, reading in social studies is also reading charts and graphs and pulling information. And so one thing that they're doing now that we're moving into civil rights is they're looking at information on Jim Crow laws on charts and graphs. They're looking at voter registration information and how it compares from one time period to another based on laws that are passed. And so all of that is still reading. It's just not necessarily reading you know, from a textbook or from a very traditional sort of uh, source. And so that's gonna look different in a social studies classroom versus a math classroom versus a science classroom. Uh, but it's still getting kids to practice those literacy skills, just literacy skills that are specific to the course they're in at that time. So talk to me for just a second. You mentioned your um, question of the day and, and when we first started talking about it, I, I told you how I, just love that because instruction is the strategy you're using. It, it is the content you're teaching, but it's also the environment you create in your classroom. And that, that helps situate all of these things. And, and I think having known you for over a decade now, uh, understanding how you're, you are a master at creating that culture in the classroom and how you, have you translated that into this online environment. So you've already talked about the question. You also talked about your back channel conversation and your responses. So tell me a little bit about how those things are moving or working uh, net for you. It's hard because, you know, I'm used to seeing my kids every day. I'm used to being able to look into their face and know if something is up. Um, you know, and that's something I work really hard on, to get to know every kid, to be able to see them when they walk in the room and see that there's something different in their eye today than there was yesterday and that there's something wrong. And I'm not getting to, you know, as much as I'm trying, I'm not getting to do that as much as I want to uh, through these sorts of means because, well, I'm not looking in their eye every day. So I'm trying to come up with as many different ways as I can to be able to check in with those kids. And so it is through, you know, those more laid back sort of responses, the, the kinds of things that would come, we would, believe it or not, even in the midst of an AP class, there are moments we talk about favorite foods. Uh, my kids over the course of the year learn that I don't like food in general. I'm the pickiest eater in the world. Uh, and so we have fun with those sorts of things as we're, you know, working our way through class. And so trying to keep some of those experiences in whatever format I can. And so asking that question every day uh, and having that little bit of conversation time as stunted as it is, because it is over a computer and it is them answering a question and then me going back and typing an answer and not really getting you know, where they are emotionally today. Um, but also noticing kids that typically check in with me every day, but don't check in for a day or two. And taking a moment to 
you know, email them directly and checking in and making sure everything is okay. Um, you know, kids are experiencing a lot right now too. And, you know, letting them know the same way that I would let them know in class, hey, you know, you might not want to talk to me about this right now, but just know that I'm here, that I recognize that your behavior is not the same as it has been the last few days. I know something's up uh, and talk to me if you want to. And we've tried to also put in place through our school, through our district, lots of ways for kids to reach out for, uh, for counseling if they need it. Our counselors are available. They have office hours. Um, and they're also available, of course, beyond those hours. If something needs to be done, we can contact them, you know, directly and say, hey, I need you to check in with this kid. Um, but trying to continue relationships the best I can, considering where we are right now. Uh, those daily check-ins are one way to do that. Uh, and it's a way that is kind of, like I said, separate from the instruction. Because... You know, I tell the kids at the beginning of the year, I don't want the only thing I know about you to be, do you like history? Because some of you aren't going to like history, and that's okay. You don't, it doesn't have to be your thing. But I want to know more about you. And so kind of continuing that idea. The back channel chat is just an open room that I use so that kids can uh, have a, a place to ask questions more directly. Uh, Email works, but not all of them want us to send email to me. Some would rather be able to get that immediate feedback. Um, and even though I'm sitting at my computer, I don't always have my email open. Uh, it also gives a chance for them to interact with each other. Some have taken advantage of that, some not as much. And then again, we've done a couple of those Zoom meetings where we've been able to, to actually see each other. Again, not Every kid has taken advantage of that, uh, and we definitely did all meet each other's pets that morning. It was a, it was a nice look. You can see my cat sleeping. <laughs> I'm very impressed. He's been there the entire time and hasn't moved. Which so. is very unusual, so <laughs> I don't know what's up with him. Um, but, yeah, we met each other's pets. Uh, it was a really laid-back sort of atmosphere. For me, I didn't feel like that was the time to, to say, okay, now get out your notebooks. We're going to take notes. We're going to, we're going to have a normal class period because nothing about what we're doing is normal right now. And, you know, I have anxieties with this. I have, you know, nights that I can't sleep. I can't expect that my students aren't having the same sorts of things. And so I need to try to, to figure out ways to, to help them deal with that and to give them that laid back experience. I can't expect them to, to show up to class every day with their notes ready to go. That's just not where we are right now. I think that isolation, that sense of isolation that we feel as adults um, has to be just even, you know, amplified for the adolescents who are very social in how they try to interact and, and not being able to do that. I, I appreciate your recognition that um, it's as much about creating the culture for the students to be safe, to be able to um, socialize and interact um, and, and to see that, that, adult, that adult role model who's calm, cool, and collected, um, can laugh about things um, a little bit, but, but, is, but is there for them when, when they need it when, and or if they need help. So I, I appreciate um, your insights. And, and, and again, I know that you are sharing a lot of your materials online. So if you want to see how you're designing your slides, again, KY Teacher on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, so I'll tell you, on Instagram, you're going to, I also have this weird thing where I, I like to think that I'm a fashion blogger. So you're also going to see clothes. If that's not your thing, Instagram might not be the best place to connect with <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Well, it just shows it just shows your well-rounded approach. You're not just a history teacher. It's a little bit more of a glimpse inside. Of my kids think it's hilarious. So <laughs> my kids also sometimes check out my Insta. So that's another way that I connect with kids in a, a very unique way that my kids think it's hilarious that I lay my outfit out on the floor in the mornings and take pictures of it. 
and they think it's hilarious that they know what I'm going to wear before I get to school. Not all of them, of course, but some of them. So, yeah, I, and I, I do share lots of photographs of my kids' work through Instagram, but yeah, it has it has lots of different things on it. Twitter is where I'm sharing a lot of the uh, the links and things to where we're to the assignments that I'm putting together right now. Okay. So, so we've talked a lot about your experience with your students, and and as you've already mentioned, um, this is uncertain times for everybody. And and I know that I've been sitting in my um, office now for about a week, and I'm getting tired of it. And so, how have you been connecting with your colleagues and staying and collaborating with your colleagues? Other than the fact that I know your husband is also a teacher, so he. <laughs> Yeah, my husband also, my husband is a middle school teacher. So, um, yeah, that is, we definitely bounce ideas off of each other. And, um, you know, he's a middle school English teacher, but he's a middle school English teacher who's all, who also really likes social studies. So his kids read books that connect to the history that I teach. And that's always an interesting kind of thing. Um, but we are continuing to have faculty Zoom meetings and, um, uh, you know, we met as a faculty yesterday to check in with each other and to, to make sure that there hadn't been any updates over spring break to the changes that, um, you know, as we're continuing to push this longer and longer. Um, so we are doing those sorts of things. Uh, we're, uh, our faculty is, you know, sending in pictures of, a, we have, this week is sort of a, you know, faculty dress we i don't know what we're doing uh, we wore uh, bright colors on monday and sent photographs and on yesterday i think was show yourself doing some sort of self-care in a photo so those sorts of things that we're we're sharing those photographs with each other we're sharing them they're also getting shared through our uh, school facebook page again another way for us to connect with each other but to connect with the kids and we're asking the kids to do some of the same things. And so uh, our school Facebook page has been sharing those sorts of things. It's been sharing, uh, we've, we've asked seniors to send in information about themselves and the, where they see themselves in the next year uh, and trying to you know, highlight and spotlight our seniors because man, this is a tough year for seniors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a, a good friend of mine, his daughter turned 16 a week yeah. ago and has not been able to go to take the test. So he is, uh, the fact that she can't get out of the house and definitely can't drive is, is, is now uh, getting on her nerves. So I, I can only imagine being 18 and, and graduating and, and really not being able to experience um, all. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no prom, there's no, what is graduation going to look like? And right now, all of that is up in the air. We don't, we can't answer those questions for those kids. And that, you know, that in itself is stressful. Uh, you know, the kids, well, if you've ever taught high schoolers, you know they've already spent a ton of money on prom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And those dresses have already been altered and they can't be returned. And so, you know, what are we going to do for those kids? Uh, to try to give them that experience. And we just can't have an answer to that right now. You know, we want to do something, but we don't know when that will come. Uh, so we're trying to, to do as many things as we can to help them connect through our social media, uh, to give them something, the best that we can right now. Uh, you know, thinking about what graduation is going to look like. Um, I've set up a separate Google Classroom. I don't have seniors this year, but I had, of course, juniors last year who are now seniors. And so I've set up a separate Google Classroom for those kids so that we can reconnect uh, and meet with each other and just, you know, talk about our nerdy stuff that we, uh, that we you know, connected with last year. And again, we'll end up doing, because I teach AP, so I have a group of, and I say this with lots of love as a fellow nerd, but I have a lot of nerdy kids who, who want to do things like watch Jeopardy together or play trivia games together or do the Hamilton sing-along together and all of those kind of things. And so trying to give them a space for that as well. So I will 
get you out of here with this last question. So tell me something that you learned about yourself or your students because of this experience and this process. I think what I've learned about myself is something I've always kind of known, but this has driven it home that, you know, I teach because I love my kids and I am missing my kids like crazy right now. Um, I like, I've always loved curriculum design. Again, I'm, I'm nerdy. Uh, and so it's something I've always enjoyed. So I like kind of that aspect of being able to really step back and think about what are the key parts of my curriculum and how can I make that accessible in different ways. But that's not really getting my need for, you know, seeing my kids' faces every day. Um, it's not getting my need for, I feed off of the energy that they bring to a classroom. And, you know, man, am I missing that right now. Uh, and it's something I've always known, but to, to do this in this sort of way is really driving at home. And, you know, it, definitely part of the stress of this period is not, is not knowing where they are right now, not knowing, you know, emotionally, are they okay right now? And those are, those are tough things. And so that is something that I'm learning more and more about myself, how important that part of my job is to me every day. And it's so, usually you don't separate that out. Usually it's just part of your day. And seeing it in those two different worlds is really, uh, yeah. Uh, but my kids, my kids are tough. You know, they're, they're working through this uh, and they're doing the best that they can. But, you know, again, we have to be really forgiving of our kids right now because all of our anxieties, all of those things that we're going through, so are they. And so when they send me an email, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many times I say, I say this in class too, you know, you can, it's okay if you turn in something late. I don't give assignments that, you know, and this is my personal view on, uh, you know, instruction and pedagogy, and, but I don't give assignments that I don't think are important. And so if something happens and you're not able to get it to me right away, generally I'm going to be okay with you turning it in late because it was important to me that you did it. Uh, that, in, that material, that instruction was important. Well, I'm continuing to get emails from kids saying, hey, I'm sorry I didn't get this in on time. I'm like, there is no on time right now. <laughs> just work. Just, just do what you can, and we're going to work through this together. But, you know, they're troopers, and they, they, want to, they want to do well for themselves, for me, for and I have to keep reminding them the same thing that, you know, this is okay. We're, we're going to get through this. You know, I've had, I had one who broke her leg and had to have, and she's emailing me saying, I don't think I'm going to get today's assignment. And I had to have surgery this morning. I'm like, okay, no, you're fine. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. In the scheme of, in the scheme of things, this 20 minute assignment will survive till tomorrow. Right. And again, this is stuff I have to do. You know, I have to remind them in class too, because you know, yeah. our, our kids are good kids. So I, I take it no move to online teaching in, in your immediate future. I, you know, I don't think so. Um, I, I just don't think so. Uh, it might've been something I considered before. And again, what we're doing now isn't true online teaching. What we're doing now is survival teaching. Uh, and so perhaps if I had approached this year with the idea of how do I build those relationships in an online environment, maybe things would look different. But yeah, right now, no, I, I miss my kids desperately. Well, I'm going to let you get out of here. Um, I will say you and I, as part of our initial conversation, I also talked about the fact that in Kentucky, U.S. history is shifting from juniors to freshmen next year. No, 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 not in, not in Kentucky, in my school. Oh, in your school, I'm sorry. In my school. And so uh, at the state level, the state doesn't really tell us when to teach the different social studies courses, but it's left up to districts and then left up to schools. And with the new standards that came out, my school decided that the best place to teach U.S. history was going to be in the freshman year. Um, it's actually not something, it, we're the only school in our district that is making that change right now. Okay. And so that's going to be a, that's going to be a change for me as I go from, and now I've taught freshmen before and I love teaching freshmen, but I've taught juniors and I taught 
uh, AP seniors for a while too in the last uh, little bit. So I've taught those upperclassmen for a long time. And so I'm gonna be spending some time this summer kind of rethinking my course and what does it look like for a freshman versus what does it look like for a junior? And that's gonna refocus me on the skills that are important. Yeah, so we'll, we'll bring you back for that conversation. Uh, so we'll let you uh, think about that for a little bit this summer. And as time gets closer, we'll bring you back because I, again, appreciate the fact that at, when you're working with juniors, you've, as you've mentioned before, um, they have a little bit more of those literacy skills necessary to be able to read and make sense of um, those primary source materials. But those freshmen, incoming freshmen, are not going to have that same skill set. And how do you shift with a little bit more intentional focus on those process skills? So I appreciate that. I appreciate your time, uh, Angela, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you were the teacher that kicked off this first uh, this series of COVID-19, um, instruct, instructing in the COVID-19 era. Um, we will have more podcasts coming out um, over the next three or four weeks. Um, we're going to be submitting uh, or publishing one uh, to a week um, for the next four weeks. So look for more updates and you can again um, see Angela's materials online at KY Teacher um, on Twitter. Um, and if you like her um, fashion blog, you can also go to Instagram and check out her fashion blog. So Angela, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing what other teachers are, are doing because we're all figuring this out as we go along. Yeah, I think our next teacher is a, a, a middle school teacher. And I know that we have an elementary teacher lined up. And, and I know because my grandkids are, are and there's one up there, it's an older <laughs> picture, um, they're in elementary and, you know, it looks vastly different for them. And, and um, what does it look like for that kindergartner who can't get online or that fifth grader who does not have the capacity right now to sit for um, four hours without a lot of, of, of support. So um, everybody is, as you mentioned before, trying to figure this out and it's, it's survival teaching and we're trying to share some of those um, better uh, approaches that, that we've been able to identify. So again, thank you. Thank you.